May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The word epiphany means the same thing as theophany. It means a manifestation of God in our midst. So when we have Moses encountering God in the form of a bush that is burning but not a flame, it's not burning but there's fire, that is a manifestation of God. Or when Joseph has a dream that he is supposed to go down to Egypt with Mary and the new baby, that's a manifestation of God in his life or an epiphany. So the words are used interchangeably. And it's true also in the ancient church that Christmas and Epiphany were combined. They uh, began as there was three main feasts in the early church, Easter, Pentecost, and Epiphany. And Epiphany represented any manifestation of Jesus Christ being who he really was. And they counted among that the visit of the Magi to the baby Jesus and how they got down on their knees and gave him gifts that you would give a king. And this proclaims that Jesus is a king of a sort. He is king in heaven and he is king to these wise people. The wise people that came also represent the Gentiles, which is all of us. It represents the whole world coming to Jesus. So that manifestation showed itself in a star, a star. So that's the light. The word epiphany and uh, theophany also means some brightness in the darkness, some way that we're telling the difference between light and dark. So the fact that these wise magi saw the star and recognized that this was something from God, it was the God of Jesus Christ, a God that was a Jewish God from the lands that they lived in and followed it all the way steadfastly until they reach the manger scene shows that there's a power in that star that it uh, needs to be, uh, it's a weighty star. We need to honor the star. So that's why Epiphany, on the day of Epiphany, we celebrate those uh, stories of the Magi coming to Jesus Christ. But also, uh, in the convent, when we celebrated the Feast of Epiphany, there are actually three scenes that you remember on the day of Epiphany. One is the star and the three wise magi, or uh, astrologers is actually what they were. Uh, and then the other one is Jesus turning the water into wine, the wedding at Cana. And the third one is the baptism of Jesus, which is what we celebrate today. In the ancient church, this was the one that they celebrated first as Christmas. The birth of Jesus Christ's ministry is what happened when he got baptized and rose up out of that water. That's the beginning of the gospel. And so Christmas was first celebrated on January 6th, Epiphany. And these stories that fill the season of Epiphany are all about this manifestation or Epiphany showing that God is manifest in us in a recognizable way. All right, so there's the setup. I'm going to talk about the baptism of Christ now because that's the lection we have today. But there's all sorts of pictures you can get in your mind when you hear this story. It's very familiar. We had John the Baptist three of the weeks out of Advent, so it wasn't very long ago that we heard about John the Baptist. But today we get to hear the whole story where Jesus comes to John. And this relationship between Jesus and John is very important, that we wouldn't have a baptism if it weren't for John the Baptist. John the Baptist was teaching people to come down to the water and confess their sins. He preached a baptism of repentance. And being repentant means that you are changing your way or turning. It's a conversion experience. So you had to do this walking down from the mountain of Jerusalem. It said everybody came from Jerusalem. Or in Jesus' case, he came all the way from Galilee. So he walked down along the River Jordan until he got to the place where John was. And then he stepped into the waters to confess his sins. And this is a thorny problem for people when they think about, well, what sins does Jesus have to confess? So he can't be there to have his sins forgiven. But he is there for something very important. 
and that has to do with the validation. Jesus gets validated by God in this baptism, but John gets validated by Jesus coming to him. This validation is that yes, this is the right activity that we all need to be doing, is coming to the water, immersing ourselves in the water, and being ready to let go of all the things that are keeping us from encountering God, keeping us from being the person God created us to be. So yes, we need to convert first, be converted, and go into the water. And when Jesus comes up out of the water, something incredible happens. And we have these pictures that look so tame of a little dove kind of hovering over Jesus. But look at Mark's words. The heavens were cloven apart or split apart. And this three-tiered system that they had in the ancient world with our earth being protected from heaven by this dome, the dome is split open. And in through the dome comes this power of the Holy Spirit. So it is more like a hawk coming down, or like a river flowing from heaven. This is God's word that is flowing down. So you can picture words coming down, you can picture water, or this huge rush of wind, which is what we experience on Pentecost. Only this time, it's not going to everybody else. It's going only to Jesus. And this is unique in Mark's gospel. He's the only one that says that this vision happened to Jesus. So we are looking in as Jesus has this intimate experience with his God. So here comes the Holy Spirit, and it just practically knocks him back into the water. And then we hear the words that Jesus heard. You are my son. You are the beloved, my dearest one, my darling. I am happy with you. With you I am well pleased. Now note how all of this imagery is a perfect picture for the Trinity. We've got the river, the water, which Holy Spirit can be water sometimes, sometimes it can be wind. But the river, with Jesus completely immersed in it, becomes holy water, right? So he's in this water, which is holy. And the early icons you see of Jesus getting baptized, he's standing completely naked, standing erect, and the water is lapping up above his head. And John the Baptist is standing on the shore. So you see Jesus in the water as this symbol. When he comes up out of the water, you have the river flowing on a horizontal plane. And then this river of Holy Spirit coming down powerfully into Jesus, which is the connection point. And that forms a cross. And then the words of God makes God's presence there. So it's Holy Spirit. God the Father, Jesus Christ, where everything is meaning, and it's a powerful symbol of the Trinity. And this is why, ever since the very earliest church, the early Christians did take each other down to the river, immersed one another, and sealed them in baptism. And the words that we say, listen to the <coughs> Trinity of the words, we baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, because of this story. And then we're sealed in Christ's baptism by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. So our baptism is always connected to Jesus' baptism. And our conversion is what we're supposed to practice every day in our spiritual life. So a good way to remember this is every time you encounter water to remember your baptism. Remember those words of affirmation. They are said to all of us. With you, I am well pleased. We don't hear those words enough. I think we're all hungry for affirmation. So when you're washing your hands before meals, think of the water of your baptism and how affirmed you are. When you are pouring water for a guest, think of your baptism. When you're brushing your teeth, think of your baptism. Every time you encounter water in your daily life, Think of those affirming words and your willingness to let go of any obstacle that stands in your way and keeps you from being the child of God that you were created to be. If we look at our service, our liturgy is focused on the same thing. You walk in this door, which most people now use, and you encounter the water of baptism first, and that's there for a reason. 
Asia Church all had the baptistry in the main door, so you had to actually walk around it to get to your pew or to get to your seat. And they used to be immersed. You would walk down into the water when you were baptized and then walk up on the other side. We have water up at the altar. You may not notice it, but when I'm preparing the wine and the bread, I pour water into the chalice and water into the, um, the little pitcher. What's that thing called? The ch uh, cruet. I pour water into the cruet. I just look at Judy Barber and I remember cruet. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> anyway, that water is there. Why? Anybody know? There's two reasons why. It's one, to remind us of our baptism. There's three reasons. The, third, the second one is Jesus turns water into wine. So we're thinking of that other epiphany story. And then what flows from his side when he is crucified? Water and blood. So we mix water and blood every time we are blessing the Eucharist. And then when we receive the wine, we are thinking water again. Water and blood. So our Eucharist becomes to us another example of the baptism. There is the water again. And we're coming to the water. As you walk up here, think of coming down to the River Jordan. This symbol is part of one of our many symbols we have of our faith. But it's one that is so important to the early church that we always need to pay attention to it. That Jesus needed John the Baptist. That we would have no baptism without John the Baptist, who introduced it as a rite. And that Jesus needed John. And we need to be reminded of our powerful exercise of letting go of whatever is weighing us down. Let it go, but you're not just letting it go out into the everythingness. You're handing it over to God. You're giving it specifically. It's not just dropping it down for people to step on. Give it to God, and then reaching back to yourself, remember that your hands are now free to do ministry because you're not burdened with whatever it was that you just gave to God.